The earliest archaeological evidence of cat domestication was uncovered on the island of Cyprus. A grave shared by a man and an eight-month-old cat buried alongside him, dating back to the last period of the Stone Age, the Neolithic. This grave was created 9,000 and a half years ago, predating the famous cats of ancient Egypt by 4,000 years. This also predates Britain as an island, it's that old. Britain was still connected to Holland by a land bridge at this time. Cyprus has no native cat species, so this grave not only reveals a striking and hashtag relatable close bond between a human and his fluffer, it also demonstrates that this area was populated with cats via migration alongside humans amphibiously. Archaeological evidence suggests that this migration may have occurred via dugout canoes, as this was the earliest type of boat ever found, with the oldest, known as the Presse canoe, found in the Netherlands, dating between 840 BC and 710 BC. 7510 BC. Thus, we can imagine that in dugout canoes fashioned from cut and hollowed tree trunks, perhaps in combination with some other more delicate craft which has not survived in the ground well enough to be traced by archaeologists thus far, these cats voyage to settle European soil from the Neolithic Fertile Crescent, likely pass nuggets of meat through the bars of a stick cage whilst moaning and panting in fear as if taking the trip to a vet whilst assaulted by the sound of an engine. It's important to note that the Neolithic period at large is defined by an embrace of agriculture in certain areas, sometimes referred to as the Neolithic Revolution, although of course, like anything in prehistory, this was not a sudden event and was a result of the changes that occurred during the 10,000-year Epipaleolithic period which came before. In particularly fertile regions such as the heartland of modern China, between the Yangtze and Huanghe rivers, the Nile Valley, and the Fertile Crescent that traces the Tigris and Euphrates across Mesopotamia and the Levant, permanent agricultural societies arose during the Neolithic period. Thus, in these corners of the general human population, which mostly remained hunting and gathering for thousands of years longer, the perfect environment for the cat was formed. The humans built stiffer settlements with regular heating arrangements and protection from wind and rain. Any predator large enough to chase a cat would be killed in order to protect children and livestock, and most importantly the constant localised stockpile of food that the humans had formed around themselves via their new system, farming, meant that vermin had become an increasingly serious problem. And this is a real serious issue because, think about it, before the cat, what was the solution to dealing with these troublesome pests? The vermin. It's hard to overstate the problem posed by these agile, numerous and tiny granivores. They're still with us today, of course. Before you get too cocky and uh, assume this is a simple problem, there's probably some living under your house. Small birds like crows or pigeons, mice and rats take their pickings from settled human society and multiply as a result. Lacking modern technology and with extremely scarce resources, this would have meant a great blight for the Neolithic farmer. Labour-intensive work meant that adults' time would have been valuable, and despite this, how can a big gangly human efficiently deal with these massively mobile masticators? <laughs> Children uh, may have been put to the task, but they would have been less effective and may have just been uh, just as busy assisting the farm directly. Of course, you know, child labour back in the day. Dogs, uh, they were certainly available in this time period, but the development of any breed which would be considered anything approaching a ratter, a small little whippy dog that chases down rats, was far off. The large dogs of the Neolithic period, of course they've evolved from wolves, uh, would cause a great ruckus chasing a rodent, knocking things over, and letting all the other vermin in the area know where they were, whilst the little bandit was likely to just escape by going in or under something. 
It's most likely that the entrance of the cat to human life was very incremental. Following human populations, the cats would have naturally ranged closer to human settlements in greater numbers as populations, farms and their surrounding ecosystem of scavenging animals grew. I would estimate their main barrier to symbiosis with humans early on would have been domestic dog as well as human predation. However, it's likely that the usefulness of the wild cat was quickly realised by these burgeoning agricultural communities. In a process which progressed at differing rates in different localities, these cats became less fearful of humans. When an impressive level of tameness was achieved in a community, they would have likely been bred and traded for other vital resources, incentivizing the spread of sociable feline populations across the fertile crescent and southern Anatolia. The African wildcat, Felis sylvestris libica, has the greatest range of wildcat species, covering much of Asia and the Middle East as well as Africa. Studies thus far demonstrate that this wildcat species is the ancestor of today's domestic cat globally, besides the local instances of tame small felines. For example, findings from a 5,600-year-old settlement in northwestern China suggest that a cat may have been fed by local villagers as a large amount of their staple crop of millet was found in its stomach. The species of the cat was later identified as a leopard cat, Prionalurus bengalensis, and was presented by Chinese scientists as the earliest domestication of the cat. Weighing this claim against the much earlier Cyprus example depends on how much the striking evidence of feeding the cat is valued over the earlier date. The the cat that I began this with, the uh, cat that was buried alongside a human, was earlier than this Chinese cat. But uh, these Chinese, Chinese scientists argue that the fact that it was seems like it was uh, fed means that it was properly tame. Whereas we don't know if the Cypress cat was properly tame. But yeah, what, what I'm saying here is it depends on your opinion. Do you think that it being buried means that it was tame? If so, that is definitely an earlier instance of a tame cat. Or how much do you value the feeding? Anyway, um, regardless, the leopard cat's taming appears to have been short-lived, as the Chinese cat population, as in the domestic cat population today, is descended from the African wildcat, just like elsewhere. It's postulated that after the opening of the Silk Road uh, trade route allowed purchase of our familiar cats, which were more desirable, likely because they were fully domesticated. This gradually meant that um, they were uh, they were purchased and bred, and uh, they took over because they were a better pet, essentially more more domesticated. This demonstrates the natural tendency towards homogenization of pet species as it takes so long for a domestication process to be completed without modern know-how. So this is why you don't have every wildcat species locally tamed in each region. So anyway, during the Neolithic, the same migration period which replaced much of the thinly spread hunter-gathering populations in mainland Europe at the time, over thousands of years, also spread the ancestors of the domestic cat deep into the continent. This was a migration wave from agricultural settlements on the Fertile Crescent, well, the edge of that kind of area, up into Europe, which we still hunter-gatherer mostly. Cat remains found in Poland date back as far as 5,000 years ago. This was the same migration trend which replaced the population of the famous Cheddar Man of the UK a member of the Mesolithic humans who previously occupied the area. This wave changed the culture and genetics of Europe, demonstrating the advantages of agriculture versus hunter-gathering on a macro level. Agriculture facilitated the blossoming population which drove the Aegean people, these people from who were on the edge of the, uh, the previous edge of the agricultural sphere of the world, you know, 
in that area at least that had been sort of spreading from the Fertile Crescent. Uh, it drove the Aegean people to spread to the north and west away from competition against other numerous farming societies. So they spread into the areas of lower uh, population because those areas were hunter-gatherers. It also empowered the migrators in Europe, which because this population that they had from agriculture allowed them to outcompete the genes of the hunter-gatherer populations with numbers, because the hunter-gatherers were such had to be in a lower density. Now, if you love the mystique of ancient Egypt, to the point where you are something of an ancient Egyptaboo, as in like Weeboo, ancient Egyptaboo, needless to say, the editor took this out. <laughs> uh, this was revised in the edit to, uh, to where you are something of an amateur Egyptologist, <laughs> uh, and or previously enjoyed the thought that they were the ones behind the modern kitty, do not be dismayed. It's certain that ancient Egypt played an integral role in the history of the cat. The Nile Valley is understood as a participant in the Neolithic Revolution at a similar time to the peoples of the Fertile Crescent. The Neolithic Revolution is the, uh, the beginning of farming, remember. However, the mighty and distinctive ancient Egypt, which occupies a space in popular imagination, did not arise until later on. The Sumer people, who spoke a language distinct from both Semitic and Indo-European forms, developed a complex hierarchical and religious society. Generally described as the earliest known civilization, they predate their own cuneiform script, straddling the timeline between prehistory and the beginnings of ancient history. Written as the capital of the mythical hero Gilgamesh, who defied the gods, was the slayer of the Bull of Heaven and the giant Humbaba. Their capital of Uruk is the oldest city thus far discovered, and perhaps the first urban society on Earth. Imagine the historical uh, context of the city of Uruk. There is an ancient city of Uruk, and if you zoom out from there on the earth, the vast majority of other humans are still hunter-gatherers, what we would see, imagine as cavemen. And there's this one city, the first city. I, do, I find that to be quite mind-blowing. But anyway, about a thousand years after the founding of Uruk, Neolithic settlements along the Nile, which were likely somewhat already economically and culturally unified because of their connections in the Nile, these settlements, which were already somewhat economically and culturally unified, they were formed into two opposing states by kings who controlled vast armies and vast amounts of slaves. Uh, they named these kingdoms in relation to their flow of the Nile. So there was the upper kingdom and the lower kingdom, the upstream kingdom and the downstream kingdom. And they were likely highly advanced farming civilizations. Archaeological evidence exists of Neolithic Egyptian colonies or entropo in modern day Palestine in the Neolithic period. This is the, still the Stone Age colonies in Palestine, then the land of Canaan, of course. Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt would eventually be united by the conquest of Nama, this king known as Nama, who mixed the white vulture crown of his Upper Egypt with the red cobra crown of Lower Egypt, forming the symbol of the pharaoh, the ruler of the two lands. This conquest, which begins the official history of ancient Egypt as kept by their government, their, their state, although we know there, there was likely, you know, pre, things that predate this, but this is sort of part of their, the mythology that they created. Uh, it's, def it's definitive of the divine monarchy, 
which would characterize the state for the next 3,000 years, as well as the dualism which is woven into its culture and religion. Pharaoh's standard titles included of the Sedge and Bee, symbolizing Upper and Lower Egypt. And there's loads of versions of this, the dualism of the Pharaoh being this and this, something to symbolize Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, where they have slightly different biomes, different environments that the river flows through. Paintings found within the great necropolis of Saqqara, outside the pharaoh's capital, Memphis, depict a small cat with a collar on, which leads experts to believe that very tame cats were kept in pharaoh's quarters by at least 2000, the 2500s BC, about 600 years after the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. It seems like the Nile civilization became increasingly infatuated with cats from around this period. The goddess Bastet was originally depicted as a lioness, but increasingly she took on the aspect of a domestic cat over time. She protected the common household just like a real cat protects the granary, while her alternate Sekhmet, the lioness-headed goddess, protected the pharaoh. The city of Bubastis was sacred to Bastet, an archaeological hotspot for mummified cats as well. Today its ruins lie in the suburbs of Zagazig in Lower Egypt. The festival of Bastet was held in this city, which was observed by the ancient Greek historian Herodotus in the 400s BC. He claimed, More wine of the grape! was drunk in those days than in all the rest of the year. Such was the manner of this festival, and it is said that as many as 700,000 pilgrims have been known to celebrate the Feast of Bastet at the same time. And if this is true, I did a bit of number crunching, because I, I read this and I thought that's got to be a huge percent of the world population at the time, because you know, this is, this is in the 400s BC, much lower world population, of course. So, depending on which estimates you choose, I did a bit of googling, that meeting could be approaching 1% of the world's population in one place. <laughs> Celebrating the uh, cat goddess, Bastet. Anyway, paintings also reflect a tightening of the relationship between cat and human in Egypt, with cats tucked under furniture like mine or yours, and they become increasingly so over time. Curiously, a genetic study in 2004 demonstrated that a new gene pool of cats emerged at least 3,000 years ago, testing mitochondrial DNA of cat mummies. Tracking other specimens, it's demonstrable that this feline Nile population grew in size and spread at an incredible rate over the next periods of history. They spread to Europe via trade, because of course eventually, with the Roman Empire taking over uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, the, the remainder of uh, Alexander's empire that was... Uh, you know, a sort of Greek-governed Egypt. Uh, the Romans took that over. Cleopatra killed herself with a snake, all this stuff. Uh, then Rome controls Egypt and Europe. And so they, you can imagine they spread uh, through that and uh, continued. And by the first millennium AD, they outnumbered the fertile crescent-descended population of cats on its home turf in western Turkey which is important. Such a prevailing spread in regions which had already accessed cat type 1, the, the population of cats from the Fertile Crescent, point to a superior product, because otherwise why are they foregoing the first population of cats? This has led biologists, I suppose, to rule that this population of Egyptian cats was likely more tame, uh, better pet, 
But anyway, today's cats are a mix of both populations, plus wild cats of various regions. Because, for example, if you're in Europe, if you live in Europe, the cats in your town uh, have likely, somewhere along the line, uh, bred with European wildcats at some point or another. You see what I mean? So there's a sort of, there's a bit of osmosis between the wild groups of cats and the domestic groups of cats. And that's, um, that is actually quite uh, a problem in some areas because certain cat, wildcat species are dying out because they are becoming, <laughs> they're becoming tame because their gene pool is being diluted by domestic cats. You know, if you imagine the, there's a Scottish wildcat, which uh, has a very reduced range. I assume that they used to be all over the UK, but now they only live in the highlands of Scotland. They are probably outnumbered even in those areas by domestic cats of just people that live in villages in Scotland. And the domestic cats, you know, as long as they breed with them every so often, they're going to eventually dilute their gene pool so much that they cease to exist as a species and they'll just stop running around in uh, in wild areas and they'll just start sort of eating people's bins and things. So there you go. Anyway, uh, Herodotus wrote that the Egyptians were the only people to keep animals in their houses. <laughs> uh, and I didn't really get into it in this article, but obviously that seems like that can't be exactly true. Uh, but, you know, he must have had a reason for saying that, that, uh, you know, probably animals that other, other people, in, or at least in Greece, wouldn't keep in their houses, they did. Or something like this, you know, he must have had some reason for saying it. It seems hard to reject the idea that they had an affinity for animals, because after all, all their gods were worshipped in animal form as well as human, demonstrating a oneness between mankind and the natural world. And what's more, their divine dynasties had an awe-inspiring material power at their disposal. This led Carlos Driscoll of the World Wildlife Fund to conclude, alongside others by the way, that they supercharged the taming process with bigger and better methods of selective breeding, turning the cat from tame to domesticated, a true pet. They had the resources to selectively, intensively breed these cats, perhaps in a way that in the Fertile Crescent did not happen yet, with the pharaoh's, you know, absolute power, Perhaps if a certain pharaoh down the line decided that that was a good idea, then they could definitely get it done. The Roman Empire helped to spread the cat deeper into Europe, as I said, and its use dealing with vermin on ships meant the cats followed European naval empires of the modern period, making it one of today's most invasive species, because that sort of spread it to all the continents that had not found it yet. Despite this, however, it may have been the Egyptians that solidified the cat as a future global species by making it snuggly and friendly. Otherwise, it would not have spread as well, because humans wouldn't have liked it as much, basically. As demonstrated in China, trade links would have spread the cat anyway. So, uh, I'm just making the point there that, you know, even if there weren't this period of European global empires... Uh, if the world had connected via trade peacefully, if you could even believe that that would have happened at some point down the line, as long as there was trade, <laughs> as long as there was economic activity, the cat would have spread as long as humans liked it. And you can see humans from all continents enjoy the cat, so it would have happened at any point. You could argue that it would have definitely spread to become a global species, domesticated species at some point, as long as it was like that. As demonstrated in China, would have spread the cat anyway, trade links, yeah. Perhaps you don't believe the Egyptian pet theory. And uh, perhaps you think something else about the Egyptian theory. Maybe populations 
Uh, they spread instead because it was considered fashionable to own cats which were once worshipped in their own land, rather than be them being domesticated. Or perhaps the cats from Egypt had a different look, of course. But one thing is for certain, or maybe they were bigger or more vicious at dealing with rats. Anyway, one thing is for certain, however, the cat seamlessly arriving in time for the first human urban societies is far more civilized than the primitive dog. Okay, now, I'll admit, I just added that in as kind of red meat for the base. You know what I mean? I know that cat people are going to read this article, so I just sort of added that in as a little dogs versus cat zinger. But I don't buy into that paradigm. I like dogs as well. So I, I apologize for that. That was very low of me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I thought you might enjoy this little article. There's a lot of history in there. Uh, I had to sort of history it up to make it more uh, entertaining for me. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. So even if you're not super into cats, you could probably enjoy the ancient history in there. All right, thank you. Please like and subscribe, follow. Ooh.